Early June in Cornwall is foxglove time. If you want to tell the story of how flowers ensure cross-pollination rather than being self-pollinated, then this is the perfect example. The foxglove achieves this by ensuring that the flowers at the bottom and top of the spike are in different stages of development. The flowers at the bottom of the spike are the first in which the anthers become mature and bear pollen. The anthers and stigma are situated inside the flower along its roof. If you look at the floor of the flower, you'll see a number of white hairs sticking upwards. These are footholds provided to enable a visiting insect to avoid slipping down the steep slope and out of the flower. In order for the system to work, the insect visitors have to be large and fat. Bumblebees are perfect and in fact are strongly attracted to foxglove flowers. Note the massive yellow pollen on its back where it's rubbed against the anthers on the lower flowers. In order for the system to work, the bee has to start at the bottom of the spike and work upwards. This is because the lowermost flowers eventually stop producing pollen and ripen their stigmas. They can now be fertilised by a bee bringing in pollen from an adjacent spike on a different plant. As it moves upwards, the bee starts to encounter flowers which are now producing pollen and this can then be carried to the lowermost flowers of an adjacent plant. If these happen still to be producing pollen, the bee will pick up more. If not, they will be fertilised. The main point is, the bee never carries pollen to the stigmas of a flower on the same spike on which the pollen was picked up. The key to the efficient working of the system is that the bumblebees almost always do play ball and start on the lowermost flowers. If they didn't, the whole system would break down. Even when a blustery wind makes landing on the flowers quite difficult, the bee still tries to keep to the system. If you walk down any sunny woodland path in early June, you're liable to run across a small fly hovering in a sunspot. This accomplished aerial performer is likely to be the appropriately named marmalade hoverfly. On closer inspection, these will always turn out to be males. They are hovering in a spot which is likely to attract incoming females who are willing to mate. This male is taking a meal break at a red campion flower. I can tell it's a male because the eyes meet on top of the head. The larvae of this species are predators upon aphids. The females are now busy laying their eggs near to aphid colonies. Round about now, large colonies of aphids are starting to appear on plants of common avens. These make frequent targets for the egg-laying females of several different kinds of hoverflies. The hoverfly larva is blind, but fortunately it's surrounded by its food. Unfortunately, the food can move away when touched by the questing jaws of the larva. 
At last, success. The struggling aphid is held aloft, pierced by the larva's jaws. After just a minute or so, its body is sucked dry. By next day, this larva had finished off almost all the aphids on this stem. Some of these will also contain larvae of this tiny parasitic wasp. Its body is smaller than a pinhead. The wasp is seen here laying its eggs inside an aphid. While all this is happening, quite nearby, the water figwort is coming into flower. With its small, rather drab blooms, this is not a plant that usually attracts much attention. This is a pity, because it hosts some fascinating insects. Let's take a look at a few of them now. The most abundant are three tiny species of figwort weevils. This female is feeding on a flower bud while mating. However, it's also quite normal for a female to try and throw a male off her back. There's intense competition for females. This male is trying to figure out what to do next. Should he, for example, join the two males already in residence on this female? The tiny, slug-like, slimy-looking larvae are unusual for a weevil in feeding in full view on their food plant, rather than internally. Far larger and much more spectacular are the caterpillars of the mullein moth. Although mainly feeding on mullains, it can frequently be found on figworts, which belong to the same family. Caterpillars lack the complex compound eyes of the adult moth, Instead, they have tiny, simple eyes called ocelli. You may wonder why such conspicuous caterpillars can afford to sit in full view of every hungry bird in the neighbourhood. Well, it's all about the spectacular colours. These are an easily memorable advertisement for the fact that the caterpillars contain extremely unpleasant, distasteful chemicals. They would make an unwise meal for any predator. The small drab figwort flowers are mainly designed to attract social wasps. Bees are very infrequent visitors. At first sight, this seems to be just another wasp, but appearances can be deceptive. This is actually a sawfly, not a real fly, but a primitive relative of the wasps, which it mimics. It has rather a hectic sex life. Despite being quite a bit smaller than his mate, the male seems able to grab hold of the female and force himself upon her without any apparent effective resistance. However, the female clearly is not very cooperative at this stage. She spends most of the time vigorously trying to push the male away with her back legs. For those who are interested in such things, because this is a highly distasteful species, 
it qualifies as a malaria mimic of the wasps. Once she's mated, willingly or not, the female devotes much of her time to looking for a suitable figwort leaf in which to lay her eggs. But now and again, she pauses briefly to bite into the stem and drink the sap that runs out. To lay her eggs, she first needs to cut a slit in the leaf using a miniature saw at the tip of her body. On the few days with blue skies, I headed straight for the coast. This is the harbour at Boscastle. These blackthorns beside the coast path are swathed in silk. These are the webs spun by thousands of caterpillars of the orchard ermine moth. See how they strip the leaves off the twigs, leaving the plants bare. Dozens of caterpillars live within each individual web. Here, quite late in the season, many of them have already pupated, and many of the rest are beginning the process of doing so. If a caterpillar happens to fall out of its web, no problem. It just climbs back up the silken thread that it's trailed from its mouth. I thought you'd like to see the adult moth. So here it is. It's on a Kodachrome slide taken more than 20 years ago. Walking along the coast path north of Boss Castle, I charged upon this beautiful slope with hundreds of heath-spotted orchids. Along the cliff tops, there was lots of the dwarf, sweetly scented burnet rose. The orange blob is a fungus. It's a type of rust which is restricted to this species of rose. I'm on the coast path above the Atlantic Ocean, just over here. And here, it looks as though somebody has dumped a load of old fishing line on the gorse bushes. This isn't fishing line, this is a plant known as common dodder. It's a total parasite and gains all its sustenance by parasitising the gorse plants, its host. Although it sometimes uses other plants as well. Late in July, I'll come back to see the clusters of tiny pinkish white flowers which adorn these stems. Devil's Guts and Strangleweed are a couple of quite appropriate countryside names for this plant. Despite its standard name, common dodder, it's not actually a very common plant, and in fact in Cornwall it's quite local, mainly on the coast. In the very heart of Cornwall lies the upland open landscape of Bodmin Moor. Here numerous tiny streams thread their way through the tusky grassland. These are home to plants such as the round leaved crowfoot, the tall lesser spearwort, and the creeping forget-me-not. These pure, fast-flowing waters provide perfect breeding habitat for the beautiful demoiselle, a kind of damselfly. A male who owns a territory is about a thousand times more likely to gain a mate than one who doesn't. So every morning, a long aerial battle takes place between males over ownership of a particularly good stretch of stream. 
The winner will usually be the male with the largest fat reserves. Towards late morning, the first females begin arriving by the stream. As you can see, they're slightly less brightly coloured than the males. At this stage, they make frequent brief sorties into the air, snapping up small flying insects. If a male spots one, he'll immediately launch into his wing-whirring courtship routine. But this early on, the females are still not receptive. But eventually, it's the female who makes the decision to mate. She does this by entering a male's territory using a special skipping Lolita flight. This time, she won't fly away as the male approaches her using his whirring courtship flight. See how she sits tight this time as the male lands on her back. Then, using his anal claspers, he grasps her behind the head. He needs her to raise her abdomen upwards and forwards, so he flaps his wings in encouragement. Eventually, she performs as required, and they assume the mating wheel position. After a few minutes, they split up, and they both fly back to the male's territory. The male then settles close by, guarding her as she lays her eggs. She flies from plant to plant, using her short, thorn-like ovipositor to insert eggs into their stems. As she moves around, the male shadows her, always staying fairly close by. Here he's sitting on a floating oak leaf that's fallen into the water. As he perches there, he regularly opens and closes his wings, the so-called wing claps. This is to warn off any intruding male who doesn't own his own territory and his only chance of mating is to make a raid on an egg-laying female and to grab her from in front of the guarder's face. However, such a strategy is actually unlikely to succeed. This is because the female recognises the intruder as a non-territory owner and will refuse to mate with him. Using the same plants, these large red damselflies are busy laying their own eggs. In this case, the male guards his mate by staying in place. He retains the grip with his anal claspers behind the female's head. In this position, he can both repel incoming males and assist the female if she runs into problems. While I was sitting there, now and again, a superb golden ring dragonfly would put in a brief appearance. At one point, my attention was attracted by a pair of wildly gyrating whirligig beetles. I don't know whether this represents two males having a fight, or a male engaging very vigorous courtship of a female. At one point, they attract the attention of a water boatman that comes in from top right. The largest denizens of the stream were these trout. The whole scene being surveyed by a very windblown meadow pippin. Most days this grey wagtail was busy, collecting food to take to its nearby nest. This was under the adjacent tiny stone bridge a popular nesting site for wagtails. Then it was back to a filming session on the coast. Moon daisies, such as these, are often occupied by a rather special spider. Just watch how this beautifully camouflaged female flower spider creeps onto the flower head and gradually takes up 
her specialised ambush pose. As she gets into position, note how careful she is to keep as much of her body as possible on the white parts of the flower head. Eventually, she tilts back slightly with her two front pairs of legs wide open, ready to make a pincer movement on a visiting insect. On a nearby flower head, the resident female had successfully used this technique to snap up a visiting dance fly. The tiny male scrambling around on her back can move around with impunity. He's just so small that the female ignores him, even when she's not occupied with a nice large meal. This male thick-legged flower beetle obviously hasn't recognised the spider. It's wandering happily around, so you would think it must be in mortal danger. However, apart from fending it off with her legs, the spider pays it no attention. This is probably because the beetle's body contains distasteful defensive chemicals. It can even pause for a moment to groom its front leg. Although they're very rapid, the spider's reactions don't always succeed in making a capture when the visiting insect is perceived to be tasty. Contrary to what you might think, this fly is actually at no risk until it actually enters the killing zone directly in front of the spider. Oops, another miss. While I was filming the spiders, the stone chats were noisily busy nearby. As usual, when the wind on the coast is strong and blustery, it stirs absolutely everything into motion, except the rocks of the cliffs themselves. Then, a strand of rusty barbed wire offers the only stable perch. This juvenile has managed to find some protection behind the sturdy bulk of a rocky Cornish hedge. A short distance away, a beautiful plant of the stately tree mallow merited a short burst with the camera. To reach the coast, I have to use my car. So I film as much as possible near my home, where I can go out on foot. There's plenty of red campion, not far from my front gate, on Bodmin Beacon. If you look at this plant, you'll notice that some of the flowers appear to have a dark red blob in the centre, while others don't. The crimson blobs are actually a fungus an anther smut that is specific to the red campion. The pollen on the anthers is replaced by thousands of smut spores, and that's what you're seeing on the flower on the left.
Here's a real close-up of the infected anthers. In theory, the smut spore should be picked up and distributed by visiting insects. In practice, I found that bumblebees tended to avoid the infected flowers. Presumably, they've learned to recognise that the smut does not provide them with any reward. The yellow blobs on the bees' back legs are genuine red campion pollen. Just another bumblebee visiting red campion? Well, actually, no. This is a hoverfly. Its amazing resemblance to several different species of white-tailed bumblebees is a perfect example of mimicry. In this instance, this is defined as so-called Batesian mimicry. In such cases, the mimic, which here is the hoverfly, is quite harmless, whereas the model, the bumblebee, has a formidable sting. Batesian mimicry is named after the famous English Victorian naturalist Henry Bates, who first discovered and described it. Not in his local bees and hoverflies, but in far-off Amazonian butterflies. So now, let's take a closer look at just how good this hoverfly is at mimicking its model, a white-tailed or buff-tailed bumblebee. So there we are, that's the real thing, also feeding on a bramble. Now, back to the hoverfly. And now back again to a genuine bumblebee. For the system to work, the harmful model must outnumber the harmless mimic. And bumblebees are really common and will constantly be encountered by foraging birds. By contrast, the hoverfly mimic is very much scarcer and will be seen less often. Unlike the social bumblebee, the hoverfly doesn't have to work hard to supply food to a nest full of hungry mouths. It can afford to relax and devote considerable periods of time to grooming itself thoroughly. While filming these, I heard a noise above me and there was a great tit demolishing a cockchafer. Another common type of British bumblebee has a black body and a red tail. But once again, appearances can be deceptive. This is actually the same species of hoverfly that we were just looking at. But this time it's mimicking the red-tailed bumblebee. Here's the real thing, visiting a nutweed flower. And then back to the fly again. Can you tell the difference? One obvious difference is that the real bee works a lot harder and moves a lot faster when visiting flowers. This was all filmed on Bodmin Beacon, where the climbing Corridalis is now scrambling up amongst the other vegetation. By now, near the middle of June, most of the female wedding present spiders will long since have mated. So they're not in a mood to give a favourable reception to any pushy males making a last-minute attempt at mounting a successful courtship. You can see how he's obviously making his approach with extreme caution. When the female reacts negatively, he instantly holds up the white wedding present in full view of her gaze. He's not afraid that she'll attack him. He can take care of himself. What he's afraid of is that she'll run away. 
Imbued with seemingly inexhaustible supplies of patience, he edges towards her over and over again. So in the end, she wouldn't give in, so he had to give up. And so we'll fade out gradually on his lack of success.